And uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, some uh, theoretical work and some experimental proposals that I've been looking at for detecting uh, axion axion like particle dark matter. Okay, so to start with the usual spiel. We have very strong evidence that some form of dark matter is out there, but its uh, microphysical properties are extremely uncertain. It could be anything across many, many decades of mass range, and from couplings all the way from purely gravitational to strong enough that it can't get through the atmosphere or matter or whatever. So, corresponding to that, there are many, many ways of trying to look for dark matter, and uh, which one to be pursued are determined both by what is practical experimentally and what is motivated theoretically. And when those two come together, that's, that's a good thing. The sort of prototypical example of that is the uh, WIMP direct detection program, which was motivated by uh, various things to do with low scale SUSE, the hierarchy problem, all of these things, and uh, the fact that you had the WIMP miracle, you had some production mechanism which naturally gave you a dark matter abundance, and also that uh, detection experiments were practically achievable and could get into interesting parameter space. All of these statements are becoming less true as time goes on, the theoretical motivation is getting worse, as we don't see anything at TV scales, experiments are getting harder and harder to do as we pick the low-hanging fruit and we have to build enormous 50-ton things to do any better. So this, and of course other reasons, motivate looking at other candidates, and another one which is uh, both theoretically uh, attractive and practically interesting is axions in very particular, the QCD axion. So that's strongly motivated by solving an unrelated problem of the standard model, the strong CP problem, and in a happy coincidence, there are also very simple production mechanisms, so purely gravitational production during inflation, and variations on that, which can give, naturally give you the correct dark matter abundance. And this motivates an experimental program which through experiments such as ADMX and others, which I'll be talking about some other examples in this talk, uh, are aimed at trying to find, see this kind of dark matter if it's there. And even beyond the QCD axion, there are uh, other kinds of light pseudoscalars which have theoretical motivations, such as appearing in string theory compactifications, etc., etc., and can be produced in the early universe, somewhat less of a sort of very definite motivated target, but again, there's a broader parameter space of axion-like particles, or often just called axions, which are very interesting to try and search for in laboratory experiments. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, in particular, the potential electromagnetic coupling of some axions. So we've got some spin zero degree of freedom A, and we've got some, so this has got some mass, and we're going to assume that it's got some coupling to the standard model electromagnetic field strength. So we have a pseudoscalar degree of freedom coupling to the standard model. And uh, if we rewrite this, this is just A coupling to the E field dot the B field. And for a QCD axion, This, is, uh, this coupling is generically related to just whatever the mass of our particle is. So we have the mass of a QCD axion is set by the QCD scale over the axion decay constant, and the coupling to photons is set by some constant number times the electromagnetic fine structure constant over the axion decay constant. So quite what this thing is will depend on uh, how many particles, how many ectofermions, etc. there are on the theory that contribute to this coupling. But generically, we expect that if we plot out our mass and our coupling, then for a QCD axion, uh, we should have a proportional relation, so in a log-log plot, we just have some line. There'll be some, uh, as we change this constant by changing our model, we'll vary it by some amount logarithmically, so it could be some factor above or some factor below. But we have some target there. 
In terms of uh, constraints and experiments, coupling can't be too large to matter, otherwise you do things like you produce it in the cores of stars or in the sun detected on Earth. So things like diagrams where you produce an axion through scattering processes. So astrophysical bounds mean that this can't be significantly uh, larger than about 10 to the minus 10 GD. And there are searches, in particular, the one that's actually most developed, the Axion Dark Matter Search, ADMX, which in the mass range of around 10 to the minus 6 EV. So which what, what, what's the S drop bound coming from? So that's... Uh, I know that the process, but the what data, what... Uh... So, okay, in particular, this one comes from looking at uh, the evolution of horizontal branch stars. So if this process was happening in the cores of stars, yeah. then, okay, so we have a cut star, it's got some very hot core, and we produce oh. the axions, they interact weakly enough to just escape. So we have a load of things produced in the core of the star and getting out to infinity. So this is a cooling, this is a mechanism by which heat can be transferred away, and this changes the, basically, the equation of states of the matter inside the star. The structure of the star no longer looks as it would if you didn't have this outlet for energy. Okay. And from the fact that we see that stars seem to be behaving in very much the way we'd expect from purely standard model processes, we can place bounds on how much extra energy can be escaping from their cores. Okay. So that's the generic idea. You sometimes hear it called stellar cooling, but it's not really cooling. Heat is, energy is escaping, but actually the interior is a little bit hotter than it would be due to the fact that gravity is now able to contract it a bit more, etc. So that's the idea. Okay, so this is so this is basically the premise space you can be interested in. There's uh, so the QCD axion provides us with a definite target. But this whole parameter space is interesting and uh, to probe by other experiments. In particular, even for the QCD axion, there's no real uh, way of saying exactly what mass it should be at. If you pick a particular formation mechanism, then, and you choose particular initial conditions, etc., then you can get dark matter abundance by setting a particular mass. But changing those can change where you sit along here. So there's a large range of parameter space where we're interested in uh, seeing if we can detect this kind of thing through experiments. And we're starting to probe it experimentally in one range. There's a lot of extra space and more parameter space that we want to cover. All right, okay, so what's the effect of this thing? So uh, this term has the effect of modifying Maxwell's equations. So in addition to the normal sources, we also have terms sourced by the A field. So we have an effective charge density. And we have an effective current density. So it's like we have some effective axion current set by and our Okay, but now what are the properties of this field? Dark matter we expect to be in the galaxy non-relativistic. We expect it to have velocities of order a few hundred kilometers per second, which corresponds to about uh, 10 to the minus 3 of the speed of light. So we expect the uh, time variation of this field, the omega, to be about a factor of 1,000 larger than the scale of spatial variation. So to a decent approximation, this will look like a spatially roughly constant field which is uh, varying so we're going to have our A approximately some oscillation set by the mass of our axion 
And if we take into account velocity, what we'll find is this is varying on some spatial scale, which is a thousand times the inverse quantum wavelength, and the bandwidth of this is 10 to the minus, the fractional bandwidth of this is 10 to the minus 6, so V squared. So trying to detect this is like trying to detect some basically uniform, oscillated, very narrow band, so one part in a million uh, bandwidth, oscillating current density. So, okay, how do we try to do that? So, I'll just talk at first about the very simplest kind of experiment, the kind that uh, is actually realized in ADMX, how might you just try to take this oscillating current density and search for dark matter in this way. So, the setup, the very simplest kind of thing you might try to do is just make some electromagnetic cavity. So we've got some, we're going to set up some big background magnetic field, so there's this, this is as large as possible, the current de oscillating current density is as large as possible, and then if we have some uh, oscillation inside there, then the power that we absorb from our axion thing is just the electric field dot, dotted with, so this is just the work that the current density is doing on the fields inside. So this then is just our minus G A dot G B E dot whatever our background B field is. Okay, so if we have some high quality high quality factor oscillation inside the cavity, then the dissipated power, if we are setting up some oscillation, is just set by the energy stored U divided by the quality factor times the frequency. So if we have some E field, this is just omega over Q times half integral dV E squared. So if the frequency of the axial oscillation, so our mass, matches up with whatever the uh, mode frequency is in our cavity, then, on, then once we run up the oscillation, we can equate these two things, and that tells us the power that we absorb is, so we can solve for E by equating these two things, plug it back in, we get that this is set by a half times G squared times our G zero squared times our amplitude of the axial field squared, volume of the cavity, quality factor of the thing, mass of the axion, and then some overlap factor, so which is going to tell us how much overlap we have with our E field and our B field. So I'm just phrasing it in this form. So that this is some factor which is geometrical, it's most 1. So this is going to be some C, which is less than or equal to 1. So phrasing this in terms of the dark matter density, this is some constant C times our coupling squared, times our B0 squared, times our volume, times our quality factor, times the axion dark matter density over the mass. Okay, so as we expect, as we make the coupling to photons larger, we get more absorbed power. As we take the magnetic field and the volume of our experiment higher, we get more absorbed power. As we take our mode to be a high quality factor, we get more absorbed. We scale in the way we expect for all of these things. Okay, so V is the volume, right? V is the volume, yes. Okay. So this is the. Uh, so it's like the dimensions of this cavity cubed. All right. So if we look at uh, this for different masses, so when the axial mass matches the resonant frequency of the cavity, we get that thing there. And if we go off resonance, then the absorption is suppressed. So what we get is this, the power absorbed on resonance scales as quality factor of the cavity, and the bandwidth over which we get that scales as 1 over the quality factor here. So if we look at what the average power is, and if we take the if we're interested in looking over some mass range delta m, which is large compared to the bandwidth of our cavity, so this is just averaging it, 
then this, we just have q times 1 over q, we get rid of the q factor from there basically. So this is of order uh, g squared, g squared, v rho over delta rep times some constant factor. So this is of order v squared v is just the magnetic dissipation <coughs> in volume. So we get something of order g squared times energy density times the magnetic field energy density over the mass range. Okay, so what does all this tell us? This tells us that if, we're, if we a priori don't know the mass of our axion, uh, so we think it could be that we <coughs> are interested in searching over some order one mass range, we uh, don't know exactly where it will be, then we have the option of either like taking many high quality fax configurations and then doing one here, doing one here, doing one here, etc., spending less time in each, but being more sensitive like on the peak. Or we do some we do fewer things which are more sensitive over a larger range. In each of those things, um, because of this factor, we just get that the average absorbed power is pretty much the same. And it's just set by the energy density, magnetic field energy density in the volume. So, of course, in a particular, if you have certain, if you have signal to noise issues, if you have different noise sources, it may be better to do one thing or another. But very sort of at a very basic level, the total power, the total energy you absorb from the axion field over a given experimental lifetime is just set by the very simple this times the experimental time you have available. Okay, so that was for a particular. Uh, kind of way of doing things. We had, we imagined some metal cavity, we imagined some high quality factor mode, we did this calculation. Is this telling us something more general? Is this true for any way we might try and search for axions? We can certainly imagine many other ways. We can imagine that we try and uh, excite atoms. We can imagine we try and excite funny collective excitations of a material. We can imagine lots of different confusing ways of trying to do things. Um, do they all have these kind of properties? Is this basically a sort of general uh, limit on how well you can try and uh, couple to and absorb axial dark matter? And unsurprisingly, since I'm saying these words, the answer is yes. So, let's see how we might see it. Okay, so like I said, we're going to be we're going to assume that we don't know the mass of the axion. We're interested, we don't know it a priori. We're interested in looking for it over some range, which is like maybe some maybe order one range or something. So we're interested in some order one range of frequencies. So I think an obvious thing to think about is sorry, since this, this, sorry I, I, I want to just understand what exactly. I'm not sure I quite understand what the question is. Okay. If if you were to if you were to just run one of these experiments, right, yes. it would be much more sensitive in the regime where the mass of the axion is on your resonance than it is. Exactly, right? yes. So uh, what I guess I'm just missing what is I, I guess I don't I didn't understand. What is the significance of this total key then? I mean So this is just saying experimentally Okay, so if we don't know the mass of the axion, then if we got it wrong, and we this was actually our function, so this was our power, this was our mass of our axion, our actual mass is here, and this is where we're sitting. Okay, I see. So you're asking, how good are these experiments off resonance? And then the well, point is that... Not so much that. It's just, okay, here, we do really, really badly. Yeah. So what we need to do in this case is we wouldn't just run it in this one configuration, we run it in this configuration, and this configuration, and this configuration, and so right. on. Right. Which is summarized by, if we take it over some given time, we just average... Well, this the is time is varying the parameters of the Yeah, so we either take uh, a long time in a single right. one, or we take less time in a load of different ones. And that's summarized by just averaging so the power of the mass. you're trying to prove a sort of no-go theorem that you can't do better than this kind of an estimate. Kind of yes, estimate. exactly. Okay. Yeah. So this yeah. is so for this one it's very easy to see because it's just a Lorentzian, and so if we have a sort of high Q resonance, it's just a Lorentzian. We can just like mechanically look at what the integral of this thing is. You can mechanically look at okay if you just put a load of them next to each other, what happens? But that's not going to be the case for many experiments. A lot of experiments might have some really complicated absorptions of functions of frequency. 
they might absorb into completely different excitations. It might be totally different from this kind of deck. So is there something you'd say in general which doesn't, which isn't tied to this very particular uh, way of trying to detect? Okay. So um, like I said, we're interested in uh, trying to look over a broad frequency range. So one natural thing to look at is uh, some kind of excitation which has a broad frequency concept. The easiest way to do that is a pulse, which has power at all frequencies. So let's imagine that we have some, uh, yeah, so our JA is just some delta function of time. We have a very short pulse. In particular, short compared to the uh, dynamical time scales of the system. So since we remember that we had that this was our uh, G times A dot times B, we can imagine that we have a step function in the axial field. Since it's derivatively coupled, step function means we have nothing, no dynamics here, no dynamics here, and then there's sort of a short, sharp thing happening there. Okay, so from the previous thing, so we had that our change to Maxwell's equation, so this was like we had a short pulse of current, and the effect of a very short pulse of current is just to induce an E field. That's just what it does. So the, e field, the change in E field we get from a short current pulse is equal to the integral of the current pulse, which is just minus G times the change in the axion field times the background magnetic field. So the energy that corresponds to this E field change, so the expected change in the electromagnetic field energy of the system is just P squared times delta A squared times B squared. Of course, if we had some existing background E field, then E plus delta E will have some linear, linear in G component, but if we average over the different signs of this, so we don't know which direction the axial field has gone, then the expected change is just this value here. Okay, but that's not what we have. We don't have some uh, very short pulse. We have some almost monochromatic oscillation. So can we relate this to that? So the trick is, if we so if G is very small, then we, the system should be in the linear response regime. So we should have that, um, let's say we write, I should probably that version, okay. Is uh, corresponds to the how much energy we absorb from a force. Just use your linear response there. Okay, so now we can say that okay, we want to relate this to this. So we know how much energy we want to absorb from a pulse. We know how much we know uh, what the energy absorbed from a response at a particular frequency is. So that tells us if we take all of the uh, constants into account that we have a constraint on the integral of the imaginary part 
of the response function. So this is equal to pi over, so I'm going to call the volume here, which is going to be the volume integral of b squared. So if b is of order 1, then this is just like the volume of our system, pi over bd. So this is, if you sort of uh, squinted it hard enough, analogous to the uh, oscillator strength sum rules that you get when you're doing permissivity type calculations in electromagnetism. You're saying how all the different, uh, the sum constraint on the sum of the response to forcings at different frequencies. Okay, so, well that's something, but we can't immediately say anything because we haven't put any constraints on the form of this response function chi. And in particular, if we had something weird like, well, let's say this is omega, this is our chi. Uh, if this did something odd, like it went up and down and was positive at some frequencies and negative in others, then the fact it integrated to something might just mean we had large cancellations. However, if omega times the imaginary part of chi i is negative, then that corresponds to the fact that the system at those frequencies must emit power in response to some small perturbation rather than absorbing it. So this generally corresponds to some kind of active property or instability, which means that if you poke it in a certain way, it actually wants to emit stuff back at you rather than uh, absorbing it. So what we can say is for passive targets, <coughs> in particular, anything which is in the equilibrium state or the ground state or whatever, we must have that uh, this is greater than or equal to zero everywhere. So we always uh, either absorb or just do nothing in response to a forcing. We never actually try and emit power actively ourselves. So if we place that constraint on things, then we can say that this is so an integrand now is always positive. So if we're interested in averaging this over some frequency range, so we've got over our range delta omega. So then we put a bound on this as just being less than the average value. Uh, divided by the range. So, in terms of our average power calculators earlier, that means that the mass average power of our system that is absorbed from an axion field has got to be less than, we get some pi over two, pi over two turns out to be the relative constant, but it's set by decoupling squared times the, lump, times the energy density in the axion field times the time average energy in the magnetic field divided by the mass rate of initiative. So this then applies in significantly more generality than the previous thing. It's saying that if our target isn't doing something crazy and active, if it's not some unstable system being driven or whatever, whatever, if it's just some kind of equilibrium state target sitting there, then this is the best that we can do in terms of absorbing energy from the uh, axion dark matter field. Okay. So, that's good to know. It means it tells us some things. It tells us that uh, like, there are lots of crazy things you might try and do. You might try and uh, use all kinds of crazy materials with funny electromagnetic properties or funny quasi particle applications or whatever, whatever. Um, but since simple things like, so uh, cavities and dielectric halospheres, which I just mentioned a minute, so simple things, these can achieve limits to order one for axial masses larger than of order uh, gigahertz frequencies. So that's of order 10 to the minus 6 EV. So in that regime, you can see that the kind of things that uh, people have tried to do already are actually, in a sort of absorption sense, order one optimal. For example, the ADMX cavity, it absorbs about 70% of 
of this limited power in a mass average sense. Just a quick uh, aside. So for the cavity setup, it was very simple. We just had our E0 field, and that could be approximately uniform over the cavity. And since the E field of a cavity mode is just some pretty smoothly varying thing, we got good overlap in the E dot E calculation that we needed. If we wanted to try and detect axions at significantly higher masses, we have an issue. Now, a cavity mode looks more like a free space photon, and if we try to look at, uh, so we have some cavity, and we try and convert an axion at a high frequency, a photon now has an E field that looks like this. So if we try to put a magnetic field across it that was uniform, our E field integrated magnetic field would just cancel out. So we wouldn't get a good overlap, and we would get rather low signal power. So how can you try and solve that? Well, one method of trying to solve that is instead of having free space inside the cavity, you can modify the dispersion relation of photons. In particular, you can, by using what are called photonic materials, so let's do the simplest example, let's, so instead of free space, we're gonna put in layers of alternating dielectrics. So this has got some refractive index M1, M2, M1, M2, Etc. Etc. Et so whereas a free space photon has a key field that looks like just a nice sine wave, in this medium we have, can people see that from there? All good? So we have that in one part of it, we have that it goes like this, but then it's got a different dispersion relation in the other part, and so on. So we have block modes that don't look like nice sines and cosines. And in particular, if we average over the total E field in this case, we can get a value that isn't cancelling over the volume. So we get some overall large thing there. So this is uh, one way of trying to, the one way where you can achieve the uh, maximum power that you could, could ever get to all of one if you have high dielectric contrast materials at higher frequencies. So this is a proposal that uh, at sort of near infrared optical frequencies we made a little while ago and uh, is currently in being, it's currently constructed in prototype form at, uh, it's either NIST or MIT right now, and it goes between them. And uh, yeah, so by using very, very sensitive uh, photo detectors, focusing this down, so we have some lens, focus down the small photo detector, you can potentially achieve good sensitivity to both axion and dark photon dark matter in the same experiment. And uh, yeah. Hopefully, some results soon for the dark photon version of that without the magnetic field. Anyway, that was just a small uh, commercial interlude. All right. Okay, so we've seen that uh, this is as well as we can hope to do. And in some regimes, we can actually do pretty much as well as we can hope to do. But there's uh, an issue once we try to go to smaller axial masses. So there, If you try, so for axial masses which are significantly less than the inverse length scale of your experiment, so let's say we have some kind of, uh, we have some shielded volume, it's got some length L, so for an axial quantum wavelength which is large compared to this length scale L, you usually find, so we have some static background fields, you find that the average power that we absorb scales as this thing, so our g squared rho u b over m, but also suppressed by this factor of m l squared. And so this affects experiments such as Abracadabra, and DM radio, which are trying to search for axions at these low frequencies. So where this problem is coming from is that your electromagnetic fields at these low frequencies are in the quasi-static regime. And the issue is that, okay, let's write, so we have our E field, which is minus gradient of our E0 minus dt A. And we'll call this like our Coulomb type field and our Faraday type field. 
the Coulomb type field, uh, if you say have some oscillation involved capacitor or something, can be large. You can have a large E field in these kind of things. But the overlap of that with the B field is, as we'll see, so Coulomb field dotted with the B field is this E, so it's minus rad A0 dot B, which is we integrate by parts, we get some boundary term, and then we get dB integral A0 dot times rad B. E is divergent free, and the boundary term, we can take the limits of integration far away, so the fields are small. This goes to zero. So the path of the electric field that's due to uh, current two charge densities doesn't have any overlap with the B field. So this is why there have been some experiments proposed trying to get around this suppression by using capacitive type pickup rather than the uh, inductive type pickup that Abracadabra and DM radio use, those fail because you have this overlap cancelling. If you're not careful about it, you can uh, not you can avoid the cancellation, but if you take into account the whole of your experiment, this cancels, you don't avoid it. And uh, conversely, if we look at the EF field, this is the part that in the relationship in the Maxwell equation is like this, so the value of it is parametrically omega over k times the magnitude of the B field, and k is uh, of order, k is at least of order L inverse, so this is of order omega L times B. So the uh, part of the electric field which is due to currents naturally has magnitude much smaller than the magnetic field of any oscillation. So if you have something like DM radio, where you have some kind of a tube circuit where your oscillation has a magnetic field part and electric field part, the electric field part will be much suppressed, but this is the part that is responsible for interacting with the axion field, and so you get an overall suppression in the power that you can get out. Okay, so this is... Um, this is not ideal. What it means is that uh, if we go back to the plot of coupling versus mass from earlier. Mass of our axion, uh, G. So we have a QCD axion uh, band, which has G proportional to mass of the axion. And uh, at higher frequencies, this scaling here, uh, the part without the ML squared, means that if you have an experiment with a given magnetic field and a given volume, then its sensitivity tends to improve, also proportional to the mass. So we have some sensitivity that goes like that, at least at first order. But once we go to frequencies below gigahertz or so, then the suppression means that our sensitivity stops improving with mass, whereas the QCD axion band keeps, keeps going down. So that's an issue if we want to get better sensitivity at lower frequencies, and it motivates thinking, okay, are there any ways around that? Is there uh, a way to get to the, sens to the limiting sensitivity that we'd like to? And uh, one way, so in a paper from a few weeks ago, one way I propose you can try and do that is instead of using background, static background magnetic fields, you can use uh, a background field oscillating at a high frequency. So we have that our, so our J, our axion effective current was G times our A dot times our B. So before, in these kind of experiments, this B0 is static. It's not a function of time. But we can make it a function of time. And if you do that, then that means that the frequency at which our uh, source current oscillates is set by the sum and different frequency, difference frequencies of the axion and magnetic field oscillations. So, in particular, if we have that uh, omega b much larger than omega a, which is the ball of the axion mass, then the uh, frequency, the signal frequency that we're looking for can be large even if the axion mass is small. So, we had this suppression, sorry, just go back, so we had the EF 
of order omega L times B, that was the source of our suppression, if the frequency of the signal we're looking for is actually large, so omega is of order the inverse size, then this is no longer a suppression. So we can try and get around the problem like that. So this is something basically equivalent has already been proposed at optical frequencies. So Sorry, before you going on, uh, yes. I think I have a similar question. You're saying that the, 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 the power is like a ML square, mm -hmm. um, but what about if ML large, the power is due to oh, yeah, no, like ML square? No, no, this is in the regime where um, M is much less than uh, the inverse. Sure, sure. If, if in other limit. Uh, in the other limit, we're just, back at the we're just back at the limit we had previously. So power, average power of order G squared rho UV over M. That not depend on L, right? Um, but so it depends on, uh, yeah, so, well, it depends on L if we have it, because UB is like B squared times volume. Ah, okay, okay. So if we had a bigger experiment with the same amplitude of the B field, we'd have more magnetic field energy sure, than volume, sure, sure, sure. so we'd do better like that, but that's the dependence in that case. So we don't get this additional couple of powers of L, is the point. Okay, so, not surprised. So uh, something that does this, that has already been proposed, is uh, proposals to use optical polarization rotation. So these are generally not phrased in this way, but they're pretty much the same thing. So the setup there is you have some photon, and it's polarized. So you've got E and B fields like this, and it's going along in some direction. In the presence of an axion dot matter background, you can convert this to a photon which is polarized in the orthogonal direction. So now we've got our E prime, E prime. It's going on this way. So we convert to this. And effectively what's going on is we have some optical cavity. We've got some splitting delta omega of all the MA between these two different polarizations. And we have, uh, obviously, these frequencies are much, much, the frequency of each photon is much larger than the mass of the axial. So you get a converted power that scales without this suppression. OK, so isn't that good? There are two major issues here. The first is that the magnetic field energy is really, really small. You're not using some big back magnetic field here. You're just using a laser beam. And the energy stored on the laser beam is kind of tiny. So comparatively. So if we take some very optimistic parameters from some of these experiments, uh, say, so they propose like a 40 meter cavity and one megawatt circulating power. So for comparison, LIGO has about 100 kilowatts of circulating power. So this is a pretty uh, major sort of experimental undertaking. This would give a stored magnetic field energy in the cavity of order 0.1 joules. For comparison, so this you 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 change the polarization of the photon. Yes. The same effect uh, affect the CMB polarization. Yes. So this is the same kind of thing that's uh, discussed in astrophysical searches. This is just trying to do it in the lab, basically. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but you don't change the velocity of the photon, right? You just try to change the polarization. I mean, the B prime divided by E prime is still equal to 1, right? Um, you, could, you don't change the velocity, right? So, okay. Or effect, you change the velocity? Effects on the velocity are uh, a second order thing in this. The, thing you, the signal you're looking for is a different polarization. Okay. Effects on velocity will be E phase Ah, the second order. Yeah. yeah. Not non leading order. Non leading order. Okay. okay. So, for comparison, if we took a static field experiment with like a Tesla HB field, so one tesla squared times meter cubed is of order a megajoule. So compared to that, we're giving up many orders of magnitude in the magnetic field, in the energy in the magnetic field. So that's a problem. The other problem is shot noise. Even though we uh, don't have a suppression in the converted power, the number of signal photons is of order the power times the time 
divided by the uh, frequency. And optically, the frequency is rather high. So we have from both in that the power is going to be suppressed by the fact that the energy in the B field is rather small, and from the fact that we're going to lose our shot limits. So, really? Can, can you remind us or tell us, for those of us who really don't know, what is shot noise? So, shot noise is just the fact that uh, we detect, fo we're using a, a photon detector which mm -hmm. clicks or it doesn't. So, it's Poisson statistics. Poisson, okay. Yeah. So, it's just the fact that it's counting error. It's counting error. Right. We have Poisson statistics, so the, most, the minimum we can detect is one photon. Just that. So if it corresponds to fewer photons, then we can detect it less easily. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do we try and get around these issues? And one, so to, yeah. So the proposal that I was making is to get around these issues, uh, to use superconducting radio frequency cavities of the same kind that are used in a uh, Accelerators, so they're used to accelerate particle beams at uh, things like SLAC, and proposals like ARC, etc. So the setup there is very simple. So usually, what they have is they have some kind of uh, cavity. They have it so electrons are going through the middle, and they set up some standing wave in here at a frequency of around gigahertz and a magnetic fields which are of order of 0.2 Tesla or so. So this helps with both of these issues. We're at significantly lower frequencies, so the shock noise issue is not as bad, and also the magnetic field is only about a factor of 10-ish smaller than the achievable static magnetic fields. It's still lower, so a high, issue, high frequency is like if your axial mass was a water gigahertz, then the static field will still do a factor of 100 or so better in the absorbed power. The hope here is that because we don't have the ML squared suppression anymore at low frequencies, this might be able to be more competitive. Okay, so to um, be a bit more specific about what our setup would look like, we'd have some cavity, and we'd want to have two different mode, electromagnetic modes in this cavity. We'd want some kind of mode which we drive, and let's, so this is the B0 field, the magnetic field of the mode that we're driving, and then we want some other mode which has some electric field, so P0 uh, drive mode, and uh, E1 will be our signal mode. And what we want is that our E0, we want EV E1 dot E0 to have good overlap. In addition, We want that uh, the frequencies of these, these two modes become close, they're almost degenerate. So let's say there's a, let's say we have some parameter of our cavity. As we tune this, say, length of our cavity, here's our frequencies. So one of the modes has something like this, one of them has something like this. So let's say omega zero, this is omega one. So you want to operate at some cavity shape such that the modes are almost degenerate, if we move a little way away from that, then the splitting is such that if we make the splitting of order the mass of the axion, then in the presence of a background axion field, we will convert photons from the drive mode, which we're going to drive to high amplitude, into photons in the signal mode. Which how, we how, I should have asked this earlier. Yes. How, do you, how do you actually read out the signal mode in these things? Is it, is it so heat, heat would be very bad um, because yeah. uh, I'll discuss the title in one minute. But you can't make these things too cold because you have to dissipate heat from the drive mode. Right. So the drive mode is uh, is this actually superconducting, so the resistance in the walls is very small, but it's still non-zero at AC frequencies, which means that you're dissipating some heat in the walls just from the fact you have some amplitude in the drive mode, and that heat is much much larger. Now, the space energy is much, much larger than the energy absorbed from the axon. So you need to pick it up in the same way that you would for something like ADMX. You need a little antenna, effectively, and you need to take out that EM field and look to it as an amplifier type. So physically what you do is you pump this, each mode will be pumped by 
basically you put in some waveguide and you have some coupling of the waveguide through a little hole to the cavity. And what you want to do is you have some set of waveguides which pump the drive mode and a different set of waveguides which take out the signal mode. These modes will be have a different profile, so you can, uh, to a decent extent, extract one and not the other, and also there are different frequencies. So if you look at, so we send, the, this is our, we get some signal at the output, which has got some kind of time in some time series. If we look at the uh, Fourier transform of our output, what we'll see is almost certainly some kind of peak at the drive frequency, but in the presence of an axial signal, we would also see some power which is upconverted to omega drive <coughs> plus MA. So what you'd be looking for is some extra power upconverted from the frequency at which you're driving the thing to a frequency separated from that. So yes, you couldn't, this kind of tells you that if you try and make the separation too small, then you're going to have problems. There's going to be some finite width to these things based on the fact that the cavity has some finite quality factor, the drive that you're putting in has some finite width, etc. So if you try to make MA extremely small, these things will kind of overlap and it will become very difficult to separate. But the uh, width is extremely small. You can get the width down to, uh, theoretically, one part in about 10 to the minus 10 or so, or even smaller. And what do you actually adjust to change these frequencies I mean, in, in practice? What, what the very, so idea? the very simplest thing is literally just to push deform the cavity walls a bit. So the way that they tune uh, cavities and accelerators is they just have literally a piezoelectric which pushes a bit up part of the wall, deforms the shape of the cavity, and that changes the frequency of the modes. The point is that because you only need to, let's say that your cavity has a frequency of gigahertz or so, and we're interested in axion at a frequency of megahertz, we only need to change the frequency by one part in 10 to the three in order to cover an order one frequency range. No, sorry, an order one mass range for the axion. Mm -hmm. So that means we can have a, a cavity that was of order meter size, we need to deform the location of the walls by only a millimeter or so in order to cover that kind of mass range. So tuning, because you're actually only looking for small fractional changes, is not as bad as you might think it would be. It's not like ADMX where you need to alter the positions of tuning rods by an order one factor, you just need to push the walls a little bit, effectively. Okay, so that's, okay, so that's the overall scheme. Now, uh, what is that? So to put some numbers on that, like I said, you lose from the fact that your field is not quite as big as it would be for a uh, static field, you gain from the fact that scaling is better. So if you take those things into account, we draw out our usual plot again. So this is our piece of the axion bands. This is like ADMX, etc. So our static field experiments down here had sensitivity which is flat if you do all the signal to noise calculations. So you've got something like here. The scaling for this kind of thing is m to the minus, so uh, yeah, m to the half. So this is g proportional to m to the half versus g proportional to m to the power zero. So unfortunately, the QCD axion has the coupling proportional to the mass. So it's still harder to detect small low mass QCD axions than it is to detect high mass QCD axions. But you still win on scaling it. Putting in some uh, actual numbers, a small experiment of this kind, say one that was of size like you could hold in your hands 20 centimeters, whatever or so, would be something like, it would not get to QCD axion, but would do something like this, and then at low frequencies, various noise sources probably come in and start messing with you. So this is around, say, 10, this is around, I don't know, uh, few kilohertz, and then the ADMX frequency is up there around kilohertz. And a comparable size static field experiment, such as uh, the initial dark matter radio stages, would look something like maybe this. So, if you're interested in this part of the parent space, maybe there's an argument to do this, 
getting down to QC axion would be uh, require larger experiments or and or better materials and or more fancy cavities. So I don't have much time, but just to mention the latter point, the very simplest kind of thing you can imagine doing is as I drew out there a cylinder. So we just have something like that. It turns out the best thing to do is drive the TE 012 mode and then signal in the TM 013 mode. If you go through all the possible pairs of modes, these, oh, these are degenerate at some, uh, so this is the radius, at D over R is equal to like 2.35 or something. These things are at the same frequency, so if you drive this one and look for power in that one, you get the best signal power to volume that you would out of, the, out of a cylindrical cavity. But can you try and do better by using fancier geometries or something. The thing that's limiting you in these cases is the magnetic field of the walls of the cavity. And that's for two reasons. Both cooling, the surface current is uh, just set by the magnetic field of the walls. So the larger the magnetic field of the walls, the higher the surface currents, the higher the power you're dissipating through resistance, and so the more cooling power you need. And also, just the uh, material breakdown. For niobium, we need the, the magnetic field of the walls is less than 0.2 tesla, otherwise vortices stop, it's type 2 superconductor, vortices stop penetrating the material, and the equations, everything's catastrophic, everything's bad. So, an obvious question is, are there clever cavity geometries where the surface magnetic field is smaller while still having a good signal. It's certainly the case that we can get the electric field small. For example, the TE mode has zero electric fields in a cylinder. However, uh, the B fields are harder. It is potentially possible if you use fancy things like a toroidal cavity. So if you take something like a uh, toroid, where it's basically like a waveguide wrapped around on itself, a waveguide can have low fields at the walls, high fields in the middle, Usually the problem would be that the end caps would still have a high field, but if you get rid of the end caps by putting it around itself with a large radius to diameter so that it's not perturbed very much, then potentially, uh, take it with a meter scale experiment with a fancy geometry, you could potentially get decent QCD axon sensitivity competitive with static field experiments. These, that's somewhat futuristic, but it's a sign that this is maybe worth thinking about. Um, I sort of draw the analogy between uh, resonant bar experiments and uh, laser interferometers for gravitational waves. This is an important thing to go after. It's uh, important to think about the various different ways you can do it. One might well turn out to be a more practical version than the other, but uh, especially since we don't quite know where technology is going and what will prove to be easiest, uh, it's worth trying to see whether thinking about things carefully theoretically points us in any other directions and shows us better ways of doing things. Okay, so I'm pretty much at time. So just to say a few other words, that's there's a uh, particular example of um, trying to look for axial dark matter with a particular coupling. You can take similar analyses and apply them to other types of questions. The very simplest extension of this is if we had dark photon dark matter, say, which couples directly to the EM fields in a very similar way. Basically, you take away the main field and much of this analysis goes through. Beyond that, uh, you can look at detecting not dark matter, but hidden sector particles produced in other ways, uh, astrophysically or in experiments. Um, similar kinds of analysis can be done there. And uh, other couplings, other kinds of um, operators, all of these things are interesting and potentially uh, also have some things lurking which are not obvious on an immediate analysis, like the scalings which you might get by doing up conversion experiments. So um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, thank you very much. So, uh, any other questions? Is this literally a spin-off of uh, accelerator research? Yes. Uh, these cavities, these cav that's really what these cavities are. 
pretty much for. No, absolutely. This is where all the expertise comes from. Right. So, in particular, um, the Fermi Lab, there's an effort um, to use their accelerator cavity technology to do uh, dark photon light shining through wall experiments. Right. So the idea there is um, obviously a bit different, but if you have you have one cavity and we drive it with a very large field, we put it in a very well shielded box, and then we have another cavity which is tuned to the same frequency, then if there exists a dark photon, then this cavity will drive an emitted dark photon field, which can excite an oscillator at the same frequency in this cavity. And this is something they're currently uh, build, trying to build a prototype of, and uh, yeah, we'll see how well that works. Obviously, it's a challenging experiment, especially because uh, your signal looks exactly the same as any leakage or noise would. A dark matter experiment, you are looking for a signal with a uh, frequency and a phase, etc., that you don't know has a very you expect to have a particular form from the halo, all of these things. Here, if there's any leakage, it looks exactly the same as your signal would. So we'll see how well that goes. But yeah, people are trying in various ways to, uh, especially since uh, the uh, physics sort of, of uh, Accelerate of like SRF driven accelerators is not going to be, there's not going to be new out of those for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, they're looking to branch out. I mean, in, in, in these experiments, do you have a similar problem that, you know, you, I mean, if I'm imagining I'm building one of these things, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to, I'm going to experimentally determine those curves. Right? Yes. And then, so then I'm going to try to, the, the, these two, the mode, the frequencies of these two modes. Then I'm going to try to get as close as I dare, mm -hmm. right? But the thing is, is that uh, in, in a sense, the axion signal is that it sort of breaks down sooner than I expect it to, right? Because suddenly these modes start mixing. Yeah. Does well, that look like an imperfection in my cavity or something like so, that? So I mean, or even, bef even before, of, you know, even before that, yeah. So even before that, you're probably going to get some issues from uh, environmental couplings. So you, even if your modes are still well separated, let's say they're separated by a kilohertz. Yeah. The issue is that if you have any vibration in your environment at a kilohertz frequency, it can yeah. couple those two modes. So yeah, you can get better, power. That's a better example. Yeah. So there's power transfer there. Just due, so in fact, there's an experiment called MAGO, which literally tries to use that as a signal mechanism. It tries to be a gravitational wave detector. So the uh, thinking is that gravitational waves will slightly deform the walls of your cavity, and that will result in power transfer from one mode to another. That's actually what I was secretly thinking yeah. of things like that. Yes, like so what, people yeah. have proposed that. The problem is there that that's completely degenerate with environmental acoustic noise. Right. So you need to have an insanely good uh, vibration isolation system. Now in this case... Put it in space. Right. <laughs> you could. But in this case you have a slight defense, you have a defense against that. And your defense is that these kind of coupling to vibrations depends on the fields of the walls. So if you have very small fields of the walls, for example, uh, for the TE012 mode, the E field of the walls is zero. Or rather, it's not going to be zero in a real cavity, it's going to be suppressed by whatever your imperfections of the cavity are. So if your cavity is imperfect by a factor of 10 to the minus 3, then your power transfer will be suppressed by a factor of a million from one mode to another. Now, it's still going to lead to problems at some stage, just because your acoustic noise is much more than a factor of a million greater than your axial signal. But at high enough frequencies, uh, that's, where this, that's basically where this estimate comes from. Uh, vibrational noise past this point will probably dominate over thermal. It still looks like, yeah, I mean, so it looks like you, you could convince yourself of the exclusions, right? But if you saw a signal, you would have a really hard time convincing maybe other people that it isn't some unknown source of... Not necessarily, actually, because uh, you can... So, okay, you, you do an initial scan, right, and you uh, don't dwell too long at each frequency. If you find a signal, you go back, you try and isolate around that frequency, you change the properties of your environment and stuff. You have, you have knobs to turn because it's a tunable experiment. If a broadband experiment, yes, you have very few yeah. knobs to turn. In this kind of thing, you can, for example, you could change That's the frequency true, yeah. of both it modes. Only work at that, it should only happen at that one frequency. Yeah. So you, if nothing else, you could build another experiment exactly. where the frequency occurs at completely different yeah. parameters. So you can, you can imagine there'd be no to if, yeah. if that happened. Of course, 
I mean, the, the sort of the order one worry is just that you'll have a sort of general background which will swamp any signal past a certain sure. point. Yeah. But at least at high frequencies, let's say you're looking for a megahertz signal, the acoustic noise spectrum at a megahertz is low. At kilohertz, it's quite high. At megahertz, it's quite low. So at intermediate frequencies, which are still uh, significantly smaller than gigahertz, so you do have some kind of advantage from your geometrical uh, lack of suppression, there's uh, potentially less of a worry there. So, so no, we're talking to um, people at Slack, so there was, uh, we'll see whether um, a sort of prototype of this gets built. Um, it's, uh, like I said, whether or not this thing in particular turns out to be a competitive, turns out to be eventually competitive with static field experiments uh, is a technological question. But on some level, I think it's useful to understand what the sort of, uh, what the options are, just in terms, very generally, how well can you do compared to like how well you could ever hope to do, and um, yeah, ways of trying to get closer to that. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much.